perhaps the greatest alchemist and alchemical innovator in the history of Europe was Paracelsus. Even his name, Philippus Ariolus Euphrastus Bombastus von Honenheim, is a monument to the very massive impact he had on everything from alchemy and protochemistry, medicine, philosophy, toxicology, psychosomatics, the spread of hermetic philosophy, and even magic. The reputation of Paracelsus as a magician flowered after his death, though much like Agrippa, the taint of black magic followed him like a dark shadow. In fact, while Paracelsus certainly believed in the power of magic, his reputation as a practitioner of the magical arts actually rests on a single work ascribed to him following his death, the Archidoxus of Magic, known in English as Of the Supreme Mysteries of Nature. What was Paracelsus's attitude toward magic? And to what degree does this rather wonderful little volume of alchemy, occult philosophy, talismanic and astrological magic actually reflect the real views of the historical Paracelsus? Let's explore a wonderful textbook of Paracelsian magic. If you're interested in magic, hermetic philosophy, alchemy, Kabbalah, or the history of the occult, make sure to subscribe and check out my other content on topics in esotericism, including very curated playlists. Also, if you want to support my work of providing work like this, accessible, scholarly, and yet completely free content on topics in esotericism here on YouTube, I'd hope you consider supporting my work on Patreon or with a one-time donation via PayPal. You can find those links below and your contributions, your support makes this channel possible. I really appreciate it. Thank you. But now let's turn to a Paracelsian manual of magic, the Archidotics of magic or of the supreme mysteries of nature. I'm Dr. Justin Sledge and welcome to Esoterica where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion. Of course, it would be impossible to summarize the life and thought of Philippus Ariolus Theophrastus Bombastus von Hanenheim. I'm going to keep using his full name as much as I can, but you probably know him better as Paracelsus in this episode. In fact, I plan to eventually do an entire series on his life and thought. So it's no exaggeration to say that the Swiss-born physician, philosopher, alchemist, and general complete maverick thinker Paracelsus dramatically shaped the direction of European alchemy, chemistry, medicine, and hermetic philosophy more generally. From teaching in the vernacular when Latin was the rule to publicly burning Ibn Sina's canon of medicine, which at that time represented his fundamental break with the then academic medical theories, to violently disagreeing with anyone, anyone that would challenge him, to seeking a robust unification of religion, medicine, and hermetic philosophy, thus making him a kind of saint among the self-styled Rosicrucians of later generations, Paracelsus can be amazingly equally upheld by modern pharmaceutical chemists and occult spiritualities as a direct forebear. Indeed, he represents the last major innovation, the sulfur-mercury salt theory, prior to the transition of the corpuscular theory of protochemistry, brought in by folks like Robert Boyle, and the veritable library of his works contain a wealth of knowledge from the, from the downright bizarre, such as the weapon salve, which we'll talk about later, to virtually prescient knowledge of germ theory, pharmacological toxicology, and protochemistry. 
in many ways, you can kind of think of him as the Martin Luther in the fields of medieval medicine and alchemy. Despite all this, well, maybe because of all of that, he and his followers were dogged by claims that they were practitioners of criminal magic and even necromancy, despite the constant condemnations of those practices in his writings. Now, of course, Paracelsus, like everyone else at that time, believed in the reality and power of magic. In fact, he urged doctors to study magic, even evil magic, to learn to properly diagnose when an illness was supernatural in its etiology. Further, his hermetic worldview, especially alongside his use of the doctrine of signatures, strikes us as downright magical. For Paracelsus, illness was not an imbalance of the humors, recall that whole part where he burned the works of Ibn Sina, yeah, that's the humor theory, he didn't like that, but an imbalance in the relationship between the internal forces of the body as a microcosm within the larger cosmic macrocosm very hermetic here, especially in terms of astrological influences. Restoring this imbalance of microcosm-macrocosm within the human body through the consumption or even the donning of sympathetically or antipathically charged herbs, metals, and other compounds in the appropriate astrological conditions would, according to Paracelsus, restore balance and thus health. It's a truly hermetic theory of health. Now, Paracelsus's medicines could also contain mercurial compounds and antinomy, among other, let's call them deleterious substances, but the break with the Galenic Ibn Sina humor balancing theory, you know, bloodletting anybody, was truly decisive in the history of medicine. Of course, sometimes these imbalances were also caused by sorcery, and had to be combated with what certainly appears to us to be magic, including astrologically charged metallic laymans or talismans worn on the body which resist such necromantic or otherwise bewitching forces. Though, again, for Paracelsus, he would resist that he was engaged in any form of nefarious magic. Rather, he was just employing the occult forces of reality itself precisely to resist the machinations of necromancers. Episode band name alert, the machinations of the necromancers. Despite his protestations, Paracelsus, like his near contemporary Cornelius Agrippa, would be hounded by claims that he was a necromancer and this reputation only grew following his death when he couldn't scream at cursing them in literature to say he wasn't one. This reputation of Paracelsus as a sorcerer of any kind actually only rests on one text, the Archidoxus of Magic, or the Archidoxus Magica, known in English as Of the Supreme Mysteries of Nature. Of course, this is where things get rather complicated. This work first appears in the tenth and final volume of the works of Paracelsus at, printed in 1591 by Johannes Huse, who expressed his own doubts that this was even really written by Paracelsus at all. Though the title of the work is clearly a callback to an actually authentic work of Paracelsus, the medical text Nun Bücher Archidoxus, written sometime around 1526 and printed in 1567. The text was eventually translated, kind of, and included in the 1656 compendium of Paracelsian works by Robert Turner as of the supreme mysteries of nature. Turner kind of weirdly divides the text up into three parts. There's a Secrets of Alchemy, there's an essay of occult philosophy, there's a section he calls of the mysteries of the signs of the zodiac, followed by a brief text on the transmutation of metals. It's those later texts that are actually the archidoxus of magic. Of course, this only complicates the problem, though you may recall actually that our friend Robert Turner, as he was known, is actually responsible for rendering the spurious fourth book of Agrippa's occult philosophy and the heptameron of Pseudo Abano, along with a few other occulty works. But just hear that, that spurious and pseudo part, yeah, you might want to, you might want to hold on to that. 
So the first work in Turner's 1656 Paracelsium Compendium is, after the many prefaces and introductions, a strangely non-Paracelsian work on alchemy. It describes a rather old-fashioned, at least for that time, mercury alone theory of alchemical transmutation, which is actually a lot more like very early text of the 14th century, something like the Summa Perfectionis, but I don't know how it got in there. Of course, this doesn't really at all line up with Paracelsian alchemy, which actually held that the alchemical process included three, not one, and not the classic mercury-sulfur theory, but three substance forces, mercury, sulfur, and salt, salt being the force substance novelly introduced into Paracelsian alchemy. So while the first work is interesting as a kind of alchemical digest, I suppose, I suspect that it was actually included or attributed to Paracelsus because the sections which appear in the Robert Turner work are those specifically dealing with the preparation of alchemical astrological tinctures, which could probably be employed in medical magical practices. Though again, the tinctures and the alchemical procedures on the second chapter don't really seem connected, at least in any logical sense, again with the preparation of mercury serving as the vehicle for the whole theory of transmutation there. So again, interesting as far as alchemy goes, but not really so much Paracelsian, at least not as far as I can tell. If you're interested in the mercury alone theory of alchemical transmutation, you should probably check out my episode on the classic textbook of alchemy, the Summa Perfectionis. The second work in the collection purports to be the occult philosophy of Paracelsus. This is obviously a callback to the works of Agrippa. Well, if you like or want a systematic Agrippa-like statement of occult philosophy, well, you ain't gonna find it here. Though this work does seem very Paracelsian in nature, though I don't know if it was actually written by the man himself. It's quite possible, if not likely, that this text, and perhaps even the Archidoxus Magica itself, was composed either by Gerhard Dorn, who deserves his own episode to be sure, or perhaps by Jacques Gori, uh, also known as Leo Suavius, who may have actually even written that fourth book of philosophy ascribed to Agrippa and also printed by Robert Turner. Regardless of the original author, the text certainly reads in a Paracelsian flair with its typical caustic and combative tone. What we find is a kind of lovely grab bag of Paracelsian essays on a wide range of loosely connected topics in the occult sciences. We learn, for instance, that faith alone empowers true magic. This is a bit of a Protestant countermeasure to the more Catholic-style necromancy of the day, with conjurations and the rest basically worthless or worse, they summon and attract demonic forces. Further, it's the very power of faith which empowers various preservatives, as Turner renders them, which also go on to protect one against the range of bewitchments that trouble the writer of this occult philosophy of Paracelsus. We learn of various kinds of spirits that live underground, pygmies specifically, along with an extended discussion of, you guessed it, treasure hunting. Of course, I've discussed magical treasure and treasure hunting in another episode, but this chapter has a lovely Goonies meet Paracelsus panache, which I truly love. It appeals to me greatly. Further, there's also a terribly interesting discussion of the power of the imagination to directly influence the body. This is an early analysis of what we might actually call psychosomatic illness. In that way, this text is really innovative. Further sections deal with what we also might call counter magic and how to drive away evil spirits using various noxious ungents. Overall, it's again clear that this section, while dealing with hidden or occult forces from a Paracelsian perspective, is by no means, by no means, a systematic occult philosophy. Despite this, however, it does contain a battery of really fascinating, specifically Paracelsian curatives and forms of counter magic. 
It's also really rather lovely in tone, again, in that pugilistic, combative, anti-establishment way that Paracelsian writings can be. It's where he urges that academic doctors are often just worthless in combating supernatural disease, and that one is better off consulting good old country women for their folk knowledge. It's classic Paracelsus, even if the man himself didn't pen this text. But after a 91-page romp through alchemy, treasure hunting, pygmy spirits living in mountains, and the spread of pestilences through psychosomatism, we finally come to the actual Archidosis Magica, which, again, may or may not have been written by Paracelsus. Personally, I think it was probably composed temporary to Paracelsus in a Germanic context, but probably not by the man himself. So we could call it Paracelsus adjacent, or as I would put it, para Paracelsus. Para para para. You see what I? Okay. Whatever. What do we have here? We have a brief statement of how metallic laymans or talismans composed with various characters under specific astrological influences become infused with curative or defensive powers. Thus, a theory of talismanic magic not totally unlike that of Ibn Sina's theory of the stellar rays, ironically enough. Remember he, he burned Ibn Sina's canon of medicine, the standard textbook of medieval academic medicine, so it's kind of ironic that he kind of circles back to the same theory. What then follows are a wide range of preparations of astrological talismanic curatives and preservatives, as Turner has it, along with specific microcosmic, macrocosmic balancing compounds for treating everything from epilepsy to gout and vertigo, even, even heart murmurs. Perhaps two of the most famous talismanic cures here include the so-called weapon salve, whereby one applies the patient's blood to the weapon having caused the injury to actually heal the wound in the patient. Yeah, you, you heard that correctly. The weapon salve introduces treating the wound by using compounds on the weapon that caused the wound, which apparently also works at significant distances, so spooky action at a distance? Spooky healing at a distance? Take that, Einstein. Of course, the theory of the weapon salve would go on to be mocked by just about everybody because treating the weapon miles away to cure the wound of the person is not one of Paracelsus's best ideas. The, uh, the other famous cure here actually reminds me of a, of a funny story. So I was at a show in Memphis where I used to live in graduate school, probably at some post-punk shoegazy screaming thing at the high tone. And I noticed a, a fellow was wearing a famed Paracelsian talisman. This is sometimes called the Trident of Exorcism. Of course, at the show I asked him about it and he told me how it protected him from evil spirits or some such, you know, it was kind of hard to hear over the post-punk shoegazy screaming. But at any rate, it turns out like three bars later, I saw him at the lamplighter or somewhere, and I told him he might want to look up that whole trident of exorcism thing because, you know, he was wearing it around rather prominently. So to prove me wrong in a pretty crowded bar, I think, he looked it up on his phone and read it aloud to folks at the table we were all sitting at. Then, yeah, it's a treatment for erectile dysfunction and has basically nothing to do with the exorcisms or evil spirits. Yeah, it's Paracelsian Viagra. Sorry, would be Frater Potens Semper at the Lamplighter all those years ago. I don't know if you're watching, but you kind of played yourself in that moment. You can apparently still buy these tridents of exorcism at various online occult shops as I was looking, so I guess if you suffer from ED, there's there's the trident. Otherwise, you might want to get another cool, edgy-looking occult pendant, though yeah, I have to say, he and everyone at the table had a good laugh, but 
I wonder if he kept wearing the trident of exorcism after that. Well, tridents which support the members of generation aside, the next section deals with the preparation of a pretty wide range of talismans specifically linked to astrological magic for their use in various kinds of healing powers uh, that cover a wide range of maladies. Again, these laymans or talismans are made with specific metals or actually combinations of metals at specific astrological elections and serve a wide range of purposes from protecting from getting poisoned to various forms of bewitchments. There's even one in there for malaria. Further sections deal with other laymans for dealing with sheep and how to keep flies out of one's house during the summer, which seems kind of silly, but it would actually be pretty useful for a doctor at that time who probably spent a good chunk of their time cutting stuff off of people. Further, we find a final chapter, which is a really interesting tabular system for calculating astrological elections for engaging in the transmutations of metals, along with a, a final grab bag of Paracelsian cures. Of course, the relation to astrology and alchemy is long and storied. Sometimes alchemy is just called Astronomia Inferior. Pretty sure John Dee refers to it as such. But these elections are of interest for those who want to astrologically time their contributions to the great work. Though I think that they're probably now out of date given the procession of the night sky, but I'm pretty sure folks can work that stuff out. That's just like math. Again, if you do achieve metallic transmutation aided by content here at Esoterica, I'm gonna need you to hit me up. That's not a joke, y'all. I'm serious. I need the money. If you make gold, holler at me. Sadly, the text actually breaks off here, whereas the original Paracelsus, or Paraparacelsus, as I'm going to keep referring to them, that text actually goes on to describe further sigils and talismans, the compositions of metals, and their magical natures. There's even detailed discussions of planetary magic and further sigils of planets in the form of numerical magical squares, very similar to those found in Agrippa. It's a chicken and the egg question about where they came from. Why books 5, 6, and 7 of the Archidocious Magica don't get translated by Turner isn't clear to me. The complete mess of early modern printing probably, but it's really a pity. They certainly further the agenda of combining a Paracelsian medical, alchemical, and magical theory on both the terrestrial and astrological registers. Of course, those sections can be consulted in the original, though the fractor type along with the early modern quasi-Swiss German does not make it easy to be sure. Regardless, the Archidosis Magica attributed to Paracelsus is important for its influence on our concept of Paracelsus as a sorcerer, in addition to all the other things he was in fact, whether he was or wasn't a sorcerer. And the text, with some exceptions, does give us a really important glimpse into late medieval magic in a specifically Paracelsian mode, along, of course, with a healthy dose of alchemy, astrology, and medicine. So much of the esoterica. It's wonderful. In this way, it's a lovely text, especially for those interested in the history of talismanic, planetary, or astrological magic more generally. Sadly, there's no modern English edition, as I've noted. Even the Turner edition is missing about half of the original text. Though you can find the English translation online for free at the incredibly wonderful Esoteric Grotto and in print with an introduction by the inestimable Dr. Stephen Skinner. Of course, I'll include a link to the original printed text if you want to consult it. Like I said, you'll need to be able to read Fraktor in early modern German. Though a great grab bag, it's like a Paracelsian grab bag episode of Paracelsian text can be had in Goodrick Clark's Paracelsus The Essential Readings, which also includes some of the Archidosis Magica and selections from other spurious Paracelsian magical works. One of the better studies of Paracelsus is Webster's Medicine, Magic, and Mission at the End of Time. It's a really good one, by the way. Of course, I'll be coming back to the man the myth, Philippus Aureolus Theophrastus Bombastus von Hohenheim, 
better known as Paracelsus, whose very name is somehow an opera. I'll be getting back to him. Until then, I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and thank you for watching Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion.